Hi, Matt Haig. It's really good to see you. Hello, Gil Keener. And you are the director of this thing called A Boy Called Christmas. And you are the Sorry. creator, the writer, the inventor, the magician behind A Boy Called Christmas and the entire Called Christmas empire. <laughs> yeah. When was the first time we met? I'm trying to think, because you were already on board, I think, when we met. Because I, what, but my earliest memory of you as part of this was when I was at the offices of Blueprint, which must have been about getting on for four or five years ago now. And you'd sent, um, you'd had to send a sort of visual impression, lots of still images, um, a sort of like almost a scrapbook full of skill images and ideas, which were all beautiful and amazing. Um, and, and, and I think there was two of the pre, or two or three other people in consideration at that point, and they, they'd called me. I think they were already sold on you, and I, but they didn't tell me that. And I was, and then I saw the sort of imagery that you had sent for your adaptation of A Boy Called Christmas, or and it just was so distinctive, and it had such a sort of unique visual look. It was sort of so clear that you were right. Um, from the start and you'd got it straight away and you, you, you'd said nice things about the book and you so what how, how did you how was it just via an agent you got sent um the book or something what what how was your first introduction first of all i'm gutted to hear there were other people in consideration in my well, mind this was always <laughs> a direct channel from your brain into my heart um uh, but um uh, but uh, you know what happens to me is that when i read something that captures my imagination the way that I uh, I know that it's hooked me in is that I begin to make art that is uh, you know directly fed by whatever story or journey that um, that piece of material took me on and I had that experience with a boy called Christmas because I got sent uh, your book and an early draft of the screenplay that all Parker wrote. Um, by um, from Graham Broadbent, who is our illustrious producer, uh, the um, the Machiavellian wizard who put us all together, and um, and I, that's I remember his, that's on his card. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and if it's not, then we need to make that happen for him. That'll be our uh, coming out in theaters gift. Um, and uh, I remember, uh, I remember first thinking that this guy was really crafty. Graham, this is because uh, he sent me the package, your book, and the screenplay a few days before Christmas. Um, and this is, I think, 2017. Is, is when the the door started cracking open. Um, and I decided not to fall for it because I thought I would be too susceptible if I read it in the lead up to Christmas. I wanted to make sure, because I knew I'd be working on this, if this is a story that I took on, that I would read it after Christmas so that I wouldn't be a, you know an easy mark. Um, and, and so I waited till the, um, the new year and I, I, read the, um, I read the book and immediately fell in love with your tone, which um, I got by page one. You know, by the end of page one, I was like, okay, this is a tone that is puncturing a lot of the hot air that normally comes with something that is either grand or fanciful or epic. You found a way to cut through it. And I was like, okay, I can, I can sort of see the way into this. Uh, and then I met Nicholas. Uh, and then you started piling on Dahl and Dickensian barrels of weight on his shoulders. And I, I was hooked. And I actually was hooked before he went on the adventure, but it was the adventure in Elfhelm that sealed the deal. Um, and I started making art. And uh, so the stuff that you saw um, in, that, in that office was basically uh, an outpouring of my uh, love and enthusiasm for the words that you wrote. And um, and that kind of led the, the the process all the way through. I was scared, uh, ironically, given the message of a book, but I was scared to believe or have hope or have faith because I'm just a cynical old writer who has had so many um, so many close calls and nearly theirs. I mean, I think all in terms of all my adult grown up fiction. I've had the film rights sold to all of them and the sum total of the films made is zero. So just because the film rights were sold, just because um, someone great was attached and, you know, I didn't believe it until quite late. I think the moment I, I dared to believe was when in London, 
I went to properly see you and you'd got this, uh, I think it was the scene where um, he first encounters Blitzen mm. and you sort of got some kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, computer Oh, the pre the, the, pre the, the previs. Yeah, previs. There we go. I, I am. I need a continual glossary of film terms in front of me. The previs, and it. Yeah, it. It felt. Oh, this is this is this is actually going to happen. There's there's thinking here, and and um, you know, I, I still. But but the moment, obviously, the moment it really, really became real was when I was actually on set, was in production, and I was just. Well, I think the first thing for me, you know, being a a writer who spends most of um, his working life in a solitary environment, seeing um, how many people are involved on a film like this and how much you have to keep in your head at any time, um, you know, in terms of set designers, costume, um, you know, the actors, obviously, and, you know, all the technical things I don't understand at all. And it just, yeah, it was incredible. And I know you sit, you sit down at your desk and you're like, he walks into a village, there are 300 buildings <laughs> yeah. and they all magically appear. <laughs> and then, yeah. and then I show up <laughs> and I'm like, how the hell do I put this on screen? Exactly. And it does, it takes 500 artists putting all of their um, heart and soul into it, but it takes, you know, it takes that this sort of fearless imagination to to suggest that, and so each of them require a certain amount of bravery and audacity, right, to either write down or to interpret. Um, but um, undeniably, the act of realizing something is uh, you can't do it on your own. You yeah. can't. You can't. Uh, you you have to. You have to build a, a small army. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't have to think about any of it. I mean, uh, being a writer, you realize how much you can just rely on a reader's imagination. And sometimes when you're writing a book, it's actually, you can give too much. You can give too much detail. And it actually, with you, you have to think of every single detail. Um, and I was impressed at every stage. Um, I can remember, uh, it's Ruth Myers, isn't it, the costume? Yeah, it is. It's Ruth. I, think, I don't know if this is true, but I think I remember her telling me that you, your main instruction for the elf costumes was no green. I yeah, right? so I, I basically, I had three golden rules for Ruth okay. that, I, um, that I had from the beginning. Um, and the first one was no green and red next to each other. Okay. Because I wanted to do away with the reflexive aesthetic for Christmas that felt too easy. And we're telling a story um, that is about the origins of something, not the fully formed modern version. Um, so no red and green next to each other, no stripes. This is a elf specific, uh, elf specific rule and no bells on toes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I ever had it in writing as a sign that yeah. all of the uh, Czech uh, seamstresses and uh, and and uh, tailors had to work under, but it was definitely a rule. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I think that's one of the is so right about it because with a Christmas film, you have so many expectations of um, what it's going to be like, and so many cliches to either embrace or avoid. And you've done it in a way where we don't. It feels totally Christmassy. Um, from the start and, and, and festive, yet it's kind of, it's almost like you've invented new cliches. It's like, it's like which I suppose is the aim of everything, but it, it, it does not feel like elves we've seen before. And none of this really, I, I didn't really help you out at all, as you were saying in the book. You know, I wasn't giving you any instructions. Um, you could have gone the full, you know, Hollywood Christmas elves, green costumes, green tunics. I don't and, know if that's, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back on that because I, I actually think that you, you give everything on the page. It's all about the relationship between the reader and the writer and the reader is making an interpretation of your writing, right? We, we the, 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 the adage is that you have a film playing in your head when you're reading a book. And when a well-written mm -hmm. scene plays out, there's something that, that, that it conjures um, that something is uh, the is 
the film of A Boy Called Christmas in my case. And so it's not like there was a, obviously um, I, I, I worked very hard and diligently to, to bring it to life, but I would say that the, the, uh, the, the, the greatest amount of invention or interpretation on my part happened in the very first read of the book. Um, and the, the version of the film that played in my head there is what I was trying to protect on the way to the screen and hopefully what we'll be sharing with audiences around the world in, in, in a matter of weeks. Yeah, I think what's amazing as well, and um, I've been doing a, a, a science uh, with my kids in homeschool um, this week, so I'm going to use the word kinetic, but it feels very like, I, I, I suppose the book is as well, but what really, you know, when I saw it uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, for the first time on a big screen, I, I realized how much of the film is almost like a chase sequence and there's so much action in there, yet the action never, it never takes over the story. The action is always part of the story, but it, you, there's a real, it, it feels totally like a Christmas film in, in, in some ways, but also it's, it's gripping, which Christmas films aren't always. And you've got this central section at least, which is all, um, you know, almost thrillerish. Obviously, um, again, the the energy of the uh, of the adventure was there in in your writing, um, but um, the part of it was insp inspiration from the scouting that happened early on in the process to the far north. So, because you made it a point to actually name check Finland in the book, yeah. which was a choice that you made that. Um, ended up being very consequential for me because in that first read, I became so excited about the idea of um, the place starting to give tone and character to the film. And my experience with Finland was very minor. I'd only spent sort of a long afternoon there um, on my honeymoon. And so, um, wow. uh, and, and the only thing that impressed me in, in that outing was a, uh, uh, a town center cat circus and that there was an aisle in the supermarket with canned bear meat. Um, and then it was, wow. and then it was, and then it was back on the boat. So this was an opportunity to learn a place for real and to be inspired by it and to allow it to help tell the story. Um, and so there was an early scout that was very consequential to the far north. And that started to really give uh, shape to this idea that there would be a, uh, an adventure that would take us away from what we normally think of uh, for, a, um, for a family film as something that's a, a little bit more contained, um, more bound to studio and to put it out into the wide world. And I think that really, um, yes. Uh, that really shaped the film. And I think the Finland thing is important because, and I, I think one thing that you, 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 you know, both the book and the film really share is that we're, we're taking the belief seriously. We're taking it like, you know, you often get Christmas films which don't take um, the children's mindset of Christmas that seriously. And it, it's all a bit sort of slightly patronizing. Whereas this, we actually, you know, I think both book and film, and I was very um, <clears throat> clear from the outset, but I kind of had to just believe all of it. You made it even easier to believe in it. You know, when I w went to, because obviously some of it was filmed on location in Finland, some of it in London, some of it, a lot of it in um, on set in Prague. When we, I went in the middle of summer to see it being filmed in Prague, to see the snow, even though it was, boiling hot days um i was totally in that sort of christmas world and it was you know visualized in a far beyond you know to a level of detail far beyond that i had to think about and walking down the street of seven curves in elfhelm with actual buildings you know what what i really want people to realize it's not you know there's tiny bits of cgi but it, it's real it was a real place you built a, a real place that you could walk and touch and uh, it's not super clever um cgi it's actually real we built it and you could walk down it and and it pretty much feels like it feels 
in the film when we were there. It's and, pretty. Um, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, we had uh, the, our production designer has to be name checked, Gary Williamson, who is a, just a brilliant, fearless artist, and um, and from the beginning had this conviction that as much of it as possible had to be made for real in front of the camera. And I, I was, um, I was fully supportive of this idea. It obviously took convincing of all of our partners because that means more upfront, but, um, but it's so worthwhile for the actors, um, for the audience to feel like the, there is a, especially when you're dealing with something magical. I mean, I actually think that it's, it's almost, it's almost um, uh, the, the case that when you're dealing with something that has magic as an undercurrent, it's a responsibility to underpin as much as possible in reality, because otherwise you're untethered and you, you don't allow the audience um, uh, anything to hold on to. And so I think that these sort of tactile moments that you describe uh, or, 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 or bits of, of world that become tangible are like handles. Um, and maybe they're subconscious, but I think they're really important in creating a, uh, a, a, a sort of active relationship between viewer and, uh, viewer and film. I mean, you mentioned this sort of taking the, um, taking this idea of the holiday or of a child's, uh, relationship to it seriously and not kind of, uh, not taking any of a young reader or an adult reader's imagination for granted. And that's been something that I've been really committed to, um, you know, maybe in an unimplied uh, or in an unspoken way as a filmmaker is just not taking any part of the audience for granted. Uh, but I, 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 I think that probably is something that I quickly uh, discovered in your writing and latched onto. Uh, what what is your relationship with that idea? Do you remember as a young reader feeling like you were being pandered to, and were you are you actively reacting against that? Yeah, my um, my first ever date as a child, I had a I had a I had a young girlfriend. It wasn't really a girlfriend, but I had a sort of five year gap after that. But in primary school, I had a girlfriend, and our first date was to um, Santa Claus the movie. Can you remember Santa Claus the movie, which had a lot of great talent in it, but as a whole, you know, it was full of a, a lot of um, stripes and stripes and bells and uh, red yes. and green. Yes, who was that? That was Dudley Moore, wasn't it? it was the head elf in that? I think. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think um, so. Yeah. And I, yeah, and since then, I mean, I love, I mean, I love a lot of, I love, you know, obviously Elf, and I, I, I love. Um, you know, Miracle on 84th Street. And I love a lot of films that are centered around Santa, but I just feel like because there's so many of them, it would be nice, you know, to do it in a in a way that felt almost like, you know, absolutely like elves are real, trolls are real, truth pixies are real. The whole thing, the whole world is real. And, and yet, you know, not to do it in a very earnest um, documentary style but to actually do it in a way that actually that makes it more magical and um, to actually really do it and, and so that's what I was trying to do because when I was writing the book the book before A Boy Called Christmas was um, my book Reasons to Stay Alive which was quite a heavy memoir about depression and all of that so I literally my incentive for writing A Boy Called Christmas although the idea uh, uh, was sparked by a question my son had asked about um what was Father Christmas like as a young boy? And, and that got me thinking and I thought, oh, um, that would be a good origin story. Uh, my incentive for actually the act of writing this book was first and foremost to cheer myself up because I've been sort of like having this sort of therapy session of, of, of talking about my worst moments in life. And I just wanted to escape into, into something. So, so I did kind of force myself to, to believe it and totally submerge into every aspect of it. At some level, you have to enjoy yourself, don't you? You have to enjoy some aspect of the process to, to convey that en enjoyment out into the world. And um, yeah, so in a weird way, as much as anything I've ever written, I, I, I believed every word of this when I was writing it. And, um, and I also wanted it, you know, to, to contain some kind of darkness, to contain things like grief. Um, because 
that way, when you acknowledge the darkness around it, you can actually make you know the hope feel more authentic, not less authentic. It can feel the hope and positivity actually has a sort of depth and a weight to it if mm. you've acknowledged sad things. And and children, children, you know, children like adults have things go on in their lives and have in, stuff happen to them. You know, their life isn't one long. Yeah. You know, it's not rainbows and unicorns way through and um i think the well, film really brings that out and actually the new elements the things that are different in the film um to the book they are different obviously in, in plot terms but they've added extra weight to that theme about um hope amid the darkness you know the book-ended narrative of uh, you know maggie smith and the bat family and that stuff it just sort of echoes and accentuates um what was there. So even though there are quite a few uh, moments in this uh, film which are different to the book, it is different in plot sense. It's not different in terms of the theme or intention. And it's just amplified it all in a, in a really beautiful way. I, 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 I'm really happy to hear you talk about this. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the, the Venn diagram of yourself as a storyteller and, and of, of, of my own that's sort of floating in the heads above us definitely has um, not being afraid to let the darkness enter otherwise very magical or positive um, stories. Because just like you, I had the, um, I, I had this feeling like if, if I'm going to be telling stories to a, a wide audience, there is a responsibility not to hold back the things that would make me um, really engage with story when I was a young person. And, um, and, and so I think just like you, um, the, the casual flex of going on a date in primary school, I, I have to tip my hat off to you. That's very impressive. Um, Cause cl clearly somebody must have told you that for me, it was well into college before I had a first date. Oh, oh, oh. Um, but um, I, I, I date was when I was 16. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a little better, but um, but I will say that the, uh, the I did have so many experiences in a movie theater or reading a book where if I felt like I I felt like the, the, the foot was coming off the gas just when something was about to reveal some human truth or or some darkness or some sadness I would feel really robbed as a as as a as an audience and uh, so I'm, I'm I definitely was uh, as much as I was invested in the world of Nicholas and his adventure and Elfhelm. It was when you went for it um, with the full breadth of the emotional experience for Nicholas that happens in this book that I won't spoil if some of our um, viewers are about to crack the book for the first time or to see this story on, on a screen for the first time. Um, I do think that there was in, in immense bravery on your part to have that um, be not just an element in the story, but actually a central part of Nicholas's journey as a hero and yeah. um, that that's not an obvious place to go and and as much as I was invested in world and tone and character it was that moment that for me sealed the deal and made it clear that this was a film that not only would I you know throw my hat into the ring for but that I would put my entire heart and soul into into realizing. I started this by reading your book and then making the film. Uh, you had the very unusual experience of having written the book and then uh, and then trusting me with making a film out of it that would give your work a new life. Um, I'm almost afraid to ask, but what was your first experience like of watching watching this thing of playing out and um, and and how weird was it to see the words that you had written and the characters that you'd given life to, you know, uh, on a screen? Well, it was, you know, it was very early. I saw a very early cut of it where a lot of the special effects were added, the sound was added, and it, was sti it still felt really gripping as a film to watch. And, you know, even in that <coughs> earliest, earliest draft, um, it was all kind of there, and it was just, just this most incredible feeling. And um, the fact, you know, just seeing incredible acting talent speak um, your words and all, the tone of all, all, all of the actors, the tone of it all the way through, it follows that thing of taking it seriously. I'm not saying it's not got comic moments and stuff. It definitely has. I'm not talking about the tone in that sense, but they actually sort of like, 
you know, if there's no sort of element that is um, lowest common denominator or patronizing or anything. And so, you know, I, I mean, I can remember um, when I was on set in Prague, I think it was Sally Hawkins uh, was um, doing some of her um, big moments. And it was just absolutely incredible to watch that happen and um, to see words that you, you, you'd you written yourself being spoken by someone like Sally and um, seeing that on set. It, it was just, it was just remarkable. And then, yeah. We were really um, lucky. So yeah. yeah. Our, our just that, yeah, well, you're, you're of, reminding me how lucky we were with our, our cast and, uh, you know, the, the fact that Sally so stepped into the character of the now mother Vodal. I mean, it, it's, 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 we're, we're very lucky storytellers. I mean, the, the whole cast, you know, you know, Maggie Smith, obviously, it's Maggie Smith and you've got um, Jim Broadbent. Jim Broadbent is very, I, 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 he just makes me smile all the way through this. Every moment um, Jim is on in his um, regalia, his royal <laughs> regalia is, is amazing. And um, Toby is, uh, you know, fully committed elf and- um, <laughs> That yeah. should be his, that should be his business card. Yeah, I mean, it's a- <laughs> The, the Toby Jones, Indica Watson um, uh, uh, casting, obviously very important because they're the first elves. They're the representatives of elf home that we meet first. And um, I, I, I remember it was very early. I think it was actually the first proper scene of filming that we did. Um, and it was up on a mountaintop in Slovakia. We had to take uh, the camera crew up with um, snowmobiles. And it was, a, it was a small crew. We were staying in a ski chalet on a frozen lake at the top of this mountain in the high Tatras. And it was a very high wire act for a first scene to shoot in a film because it was just like everything could go wrong. Um, we were literally filming on a frozen lake and we were just all taking a, making the assumption that the, the lake was frozen enough to support our crew and equipment. But um, it would have been a really dramatic start to the film actually, if that wasn't the case, but, um, but, it worked out and not only did it work out, it's a pivotal scene because it's when Nicholas first meets the elves. Um, but uh, we just, there were certain things that happened in that, in the shooting of that scene, like a, a natural blizzard starting to come in and the wind whipping up across Nicholas's hair and his scarf, his hat um, and, and connecting him to that place that felt like something was happening in the making of this film that was going to create a certain road ahead that would, that would give it stability and grounding. And I, I remember feeling it was such a difficult sequence to film because it was seven pages of dialogue with swirling snow and changing light and all this, uh, all this rigorous environment um, or, you know, very fraught, difficult environment, but, um, it was also the most exhilarating start because I felt when I came back from that shoot that we were going to have a film and that, that the story um, uh, that I had read in my home just after Christmas was starting to come to life. And it, I, I just, that, that for me will always be a really uh, pivotal moment of the making of this film. You, you really feel the cold in that scene as well, which is great. And then it was so cold, so <laughs> cold. I've never been so cold. I'm, I'm from the San Fernando Valley, you know. I, um, I that just shows my commitment to telling your story that I was able to subject myself. Um, I, 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 my, my, my deepest, darkest secret is I went through almost the entirety of this shoot with, um, uh, with electric socks that I could control via an app on my phone. Um, just to allow my my baby self to survive the shoot. That was your secret. Wow. <laughs> now it's out. Now it's out. Yeah. And um, have you ever th have you ever seen? I was there. I think the first day I arrived on set properly, it was um, Aunt Carlotta, it was Kirsten Wig, and um, Nicholas, obviously. And Nicholas was having to eat um, the soup. And. and um, yeah, that whole, that's so fairy tale, that stuff, and the way you've done the um, cabin in the woods, and um, it was great. And she, she's, brilliant. she's brilliant. She's brilliant. Yeah, I have PTSD over that, that day of shooting. I remember, <laughs> I remember it so well because poor Henry 
was miserable eating that that soup, which is kind of the point. Yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, that was borderline yeah. sadistic. And I suppose I suppose you've got to mention Henry himself, as he is the boy called Christmas, the boy called Nicholas, and the boy called Christmas. And he, you know, he he's just he's amazing. The people I've watched it with recently have all commented about how um, amazing he is, and um, you know, because. He's in almost every scene, isn't he? I mean, as soon as the story gets going, he's in the whole expanse of it. So it really, you know, he had to be good and he is good and he's visually, you know, he's got a distinctive look to him and he's just um, brilliant. And uh, yeah, uh, so what was your, what, yeah, I suppose, what was your experience? I can, I can remember Henry on set um, being great. And, uh, but I also remember him, um, hiding from there was a tutor on set, wasn't there? And yeah, 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 yeah. Playing. Uh, <laughs> he football. was. He was. Uh, he's a hundred percent authentic. It's a. It's. It's very rare to meet a young person who can go in front of cameras and behind cameras and give you something unvarnished. Um, somehow, even though this was his first proper big role in a in a in a big film, he. Um, he never had to uh, hide or reveal a part of himself. There was just a naturalism to what he brought to the film that allowed the entire magical apparatus of the, of, of the rest of the story to play without feeling like it was overburdened or like there was always some kind of, you know, me uh, mechanical ploy to create emotion or empathy because Henry, um, also, it's a very strange experience for me. He was there in the in the first audition, the, the first round of young people that I met uh, for Nicholas. Um, Susie really? Figgis, the casting director, just pulled out an absolute magical um, party trick by having the right actor in the first group of young people that I that I read. And I, I kept going through the motions for a few more months, reading other people, but there was never any question in my mind. Like this was this was the kid, um, and uh, yeah, we 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 were lucky. He has eyes that are as big as the world. He has a, a he has a deep soul, um, and he's really not that bothered by the whole business of making a giant film uh, around the world. And so we yeah. we we lucked out. There's nothing. Yeah, he hasn't got that you know, that child star thing where, you know, it, it doesn't feel like you're watching a child actor. You feel like you're just watching Nicholas and he's being himself. And um, yeah, no, he's great. I can, there's that scene where just from the start where he's talking to his dad and his dad's, uh, Joel is um, recounting the story of um, Alfhelm and he just sort of looks naturally, so natural in that scene. Yeah, we've been asked to think of like favorite moments. It's really hard for me to think, to actually single out any, favorite moment within the film um because it's just it all each moment depends on every other moment and it's also brilliant i mean i absolutely i mean the the cast is amazing i think sally hawkins is absolutely uh so wonderful and really gets her teeth into this role and she she manages to take a character who's relatively layered you know there's obviously a gender switch father vodal to mother vodal from book to screen but um she adds a kind of vulnerability to that character, which wasn't really um, in my version. And it's just added an extra kind of layer. Mm. That whole backstory, which is an addition. It's not in the, um, it's not really in um, the book, but you know, I can remember having conversations with you about it and sort of working out and we were unsure how it go. It has played so brilliantly. I mean, that adds an extra, level of emotion. I think there's three possible points where audiences could have wet eyes in this, but that moment with Sally Hawkins, without giving too much away, because it's towards the end, is just really good. And she's- Without, without giving anything away, that's also the moment where for me, the, 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 the journey of the, of the film becomes worthwhile. Um, I'm totally with you. And it's it's mostly, I think, the, again, uh, I, I want audiences to be able to get to, to these moments on their own and not be um, not not be led by by us with an agenda. But um, it, uh, it it makes me mostly grateful because it means that um, that Nicholas's journey hasn't been wasted, that uh, everything that he's 
put at stake everything that he's gained and lost along the way becomes meaningful at that moment. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a really gratifying moment to sit back as a, as a filmmaker. Um, and, uh, and I can only imagine that for you having given birth to this, to this young man, to this character, that, that, that has to feel nice. Um, yeah, I can't wait for audiences to see this film. I feel so lucky, Matt, that I've gotten to meet you in this process because, um, uh, I, I, you know, it's not very often that I, I meet a collaborator who, uh, this is a tenuous relationship, you know, director to author. Most of the time this goes really wrong. Um, like I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the premiere and then I'm just going to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so you're, it. You're you're the best, and um, I'm uh, I, one of the many uh, happy events of the making of this film is that I've gotten the chance to meet you and and um, and call you a friend. So I'm uh, I'm grateful for that. Oh, Gil, you you've even managed to ha create a sense. I know emotion. it's my my third <laughs> act uh, surprise. <laughs> I don't fall for it. It's it's like a, it has. I'm a has. I'm a I'm a, I'm a dramatist. Feels, this is what I do. It does. It feels genuinely beyond the working relationship. I think we've become friends now, and you know you've obviously been down um, to Brighton. We're going to come and see you. London and yeah, no, it's lovely. And it was it was so great from the start just to have. I I feel like you know, as a writer, you've just got to trust people. And because it was so in the right hands from the start, it was just like it's been fun actually to see. I'm not one of those writers who wants to see every page on the screen. You just want someone else to tell that story in their own way and do it brilliantly. And you've done all those things. And I, I'm just um, pleased at what you've given to the world because it is you know it's from the book but it's a totally separate thing and you've elevated so many things and it's wonderful i can't wait for people to see it and um yeah can't wait to have a cup of tea. yeah let's um, let's do it um uh so the film's coming out uh, in uh in november heading into christmas um and uh and i'm i'm really proud of it i can't wait for for the world to see it Thank you, Matt. No, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.